So nothing much, just I would like to give some brief intro about ES Home Education, what we are doing here and all. So we started our institute way back in 2010 with the name of Alma Academy. So with a group of people. So where they helped us. Uh, Of webinars, uh, surprisingly, almost uh, fifteen thousand people we reached in the last five years, in terms of academic webinars, in terms of this uh, meeting one to one persons, connecting offline webinars, seminars, all those things. So these are the recent webinars what we have conducted. Like this webinar only. Today we have this GPAD webinar. So like that we used to conduct for multiple oppor uh, opportunities available in pharmacy. It can be like artificial intelligence. It can be like central drug inspector. It can be like GPAD, government pharmacist. All those things. So last year, uh, 2023, for the World Pharmacist Week, we have conducted almost back to back everyday webinars in various topics. And uh, I hope many of you have attended it and uh, we have given certifications also for this as a participation certificate. Fine, right. we have conducted with our ambition, sir. Uh, you make the best wishes webinar for this uh, pharmacist day as well. These are a couple of pictures just would like to show. So why we are doing all those things just to give the best care for the students and the gap what we observe from the academics and the industry is that awareness and skills. So if people are aware of that, these many career opportunities are available for me, then the path will be easier for them. Their seniors can guide in various career opportunities. So many of the pharmacy students, the problem main lacking is they are not having proper guidance from the seniors 
proper uh, awareness about the knowledge i mean uh, career opportunities what are existing for the right now bfmc students so i'll be forwarding this ppt also once the webinar is done so uh, nowadays this pharma it is trending if you ask me pharma it it is not only pharmacovigilance clinical sas or uh, cda there are so many opportunities available for the pharmacy students in pharma it a pharmacy guy working on a system or maybe tool any software he will be considered as a pharma it guy so there digital marketing is there publications is there artificial intelligence there is there definitely we will be having industrial expert expert oriented sessions every saturday it is a part of gpad coaching curriculum uh, myself and upendra sir uh, we both plan together that every saturday we will be inviting uh, some industry persons from the industry and we'll give some awareness to the students also but our ultimate priority is that you should get into a top notch universities like maybe naipur iit bhu or ict or manipal bits whatever maybe what are the premier institutes available across the india our intention is that you should get into that after getting into that once you complete your two years there your mindset will change completely and your career will be in the next level so this is one of my favorite quote whoever joins bs pharma education this will be like mantra for them so i always remind them in every session i always keep this quotation in every my ppt the best way to predict your future is create it if you are celebrating your diwali this year at your hometown make sure next year you are celebrating your diwali at naipur mohali or naipur uh, hyderabad naipur ahmedabad whatever may be the institute what you are desiring it's it's easy why i'm so confident about this quotation is that i have seen people from last 4 5 years they have no make and note where they want to be after 2 years where they want to be after 5 years where they want to be after 10 years and trust me those things are really manifesting in their life so when we see their whatsapp status joining in the naipur and leaving the naipur giving farewell parties to the students so all those things that makes us very happy and they comment as in the whatsapp that so it's all because one day like this we have taken some session to us we realized the importance of gpat we realized the importance of naipur and we made all our journey this way so that is that that is what ultimate satisfaction gives for the es pharma team fine so if anyone not known this quotation please make sure you predict your future by creating yourself as simple as that tomorrow what you want to do you can create it on your own by planning it today as simple as that so these are some uh, motivational uh, guidelines what we have but uh, definitely in the next class or maybe when we get some time i'll share more detailed uh, description of this so why gpad is important more than me upendra sir is the more uh, relevant person uh, how he has uh, changed from b farm to m farm and what is his experience at uh, bhu and he'll be sharing all those things so this is actually general ppt what i tell to all my students so here are some uh, few examples here just i don't want to give in detail uh, description here just i want to show some faces here maybe already some of you have seen in the youtube channel uh, one is mr pawan nayak from guntur area to naipur mohali it's a long jump and another is pushpa who is having almost 8 years academic gap from b farm to m farm so she joined with us in pg uh, for pg set coaching we motivated her we guided her for uh, gpat she didn't stop at gpat she went to naipur she has secured gold medal in pharmaceutical analysis batch of 2018 to 2020 so these are all like uh, feathers in the crop so i feel that so getting a normal student maybe b farm passed out getting into naipur may not be that much difficult but having gap of 8 years academics and getting into naipur not only getting into naipur getting gold medal is a difficult it's very challenge but she could able to achieve it apart from that she is doing her phd in the naipur hyderabad right now so that is what the credibility if you can plan your future you can create yourself for the best so these are some ranks just would like to show here 
from 2023, 2022, 2021. Why I'm showing all these many faces is that the people who are attending right now, their story may really seems to be same like somebody who is mentioned here. Somebody might be accidentally attending this webinar. Somebody already decided to go for GPAT and attending this webinar. Somebody might have some financial concerns. Somebody really feel that I have so many backlogs with me. Somebody might feel that GPAT is not my cup of tea. Somebody feel that I am literally struggling at my academics and that too you are providing me online classes. So can I make it possible? Trust me, after lockdown 2020 March 22nd till today, we have completed almost some eight batches for GPAT. So these are all online students. They made their journey from their home to Naipur. Fine. So these are some ranks. Just I'd like to rush the slides. Uh, this is one of the example by Farid Pasha. What he shared is just I don't want to show the complete video. If you want to see the video, you can go to our YouTube channel. You can see there. So only thing he wants he is sharing here is that he has almost seven eight backlogs at the end of third year, but he has cleared all the subjects in the final year, and he made his journey to Naipur Mahadev. Hello everyone, my name is Farid Pasha. So it's an end video, so I don't want to waste your time. Maybe you can visit later. And this guy is very special to us. Uh, he joined between uh, before the lockdown. He said only one thing, sir, offline. Also, I can't understand in my college, but how can I make my journey to online and then to Naipur? It's highly impossible for me. You can search his profile in the GA, I mean, uh, LinkedIn. He's right now working in the GSK and very challenging guy. So he himself decided to become part of Naipur and he made his journey to GSK today. And not only that, he's motivating a lot of students. He's motivating a lot of his friends. When you see his LinkedIn profile, always every day for every two, three days, he'll keep some motivational message to the students and at least one or two gets benefit from that. Indraja, of course, topper, uh, we can't say much anything about toppers, right? So I always uh, tell this. So toppers will always have different kind of vision. So they don't want to uh, waste a single minute. So, yeah, our rank is, uh, how can you first rank? In GPAT 2021, uh, Naipur is uh, 85. And if you ask me all India rank, it is Naipur all India rank 4. And we conduct some awareness sessions also with the alumni students. And uh, this year also we conducted with uh, Sai Kinera and uh, Muskan. We have conducted with uh, Bundharika, all those people. So why I'm showing all these examples? It's just because of simple belief. Seeing is believing. If they can do it, you can do it. And if they if they, fail, they have not done something, and you can do more than better than that. Forget about this quote. I'll tell my personal experience of the last 10, 12 years, where I have seen these many people, they made their journey from the small remote areas, having some financial concerns, having some academic backlogs. They made their journey all the way to Naipur Mohali, Mumbai ICT, so Naipur Ahmedabad, and some made into bits, uh, might be have seen Anusha, right? So I always mention, mention her example. She is completing her pharmacy pharmacology from bits Hyderabad. So the life will be in the next level. So my only motto is that don't get afraid of this GPAT exam. It's very easy when you have proper guidance, plan, academic schedule, and the mentorship, right mentorship. So our process is very simple. We'll uh, make you prepare. We'll make you practice, and you you will perform at the best, right? By end of this coaching, whatever uh, coaching we are planning from last one year uh, for the next one year, it will be purely in a different level. And with this year, we want to focus more on more uh, very big ranks, and we don't want to take a huge crowd. We want to take very limited people who are really serious for the GPAT. It is not like somebody is coming and throwing the stone at the GPAT. So we don't want to uh, take those kind of students. If you're really serious and want to attend for the classes, 
and you want to see the best of yourself for the next two, three years, ES Pharma Education is dedicated for you. So preparation details, coaching details, all these things, uh, maybe Dr. Jyotishi or Rupendra sir will, uh, will tell any of them. Okay. So with this, uh, I really thank each and every person for uh, taking your time and joining for the session. Now I give the session to Rupendra sir. So he'll be taking for the next uh, one, one and a half hour. Pay utmost attention. So don't waste a single minute. And if you are engaging in the, any other activities, please do refrain from all those activities. Sit quietly at some place and uh, give your best. I can say this day will be like a, a career changing day for you. Trust me. Uh, this is maybe like uh, some 200 plus beginner for me. So I will be speaking a lot if you give me a lot of time, but I don't want to waste much of your time. So with this, I'm handing session to Upendra sir. So maybe tomorrow uh, again I'll speak to you. All. Thank you, thank you. All. Have a great day. Go to you, sir, Upendra. Uh, firstly, I am Upendra. I have. Uh, cleared this examination of GPAT. I'm a postgraduate from IIT BHU and I deal mostly with um, pharmacology, anatomy, physiology, and, uh, and medicinal chemistry. A um, few things I would like to tell you upfront is that this is an examination that is quite possible. And sometimes if you are consistent with your preparation, it's quite easy uh, to crack. A uh, few aspects from my experience is that I actually started preparing from my third year, uh, realizing the importance of the future. And in that way, I started studying from textbooks and took guidance from a lot of people. And I was able to score a rank of uh, 69 back then. And then I joined research. And after a while, I worked in market research and then I moved to consulting. So in the consulting space, what I saw was there is a huge amount of farmer requirement, simply phenomenal amount of farmer requirement. If you ask me that a guy who is, um, you know, uh, aspiring for a job, you know, that person's salary uh, is somewhere in those days, uh, would be about three to three point five lakhs for an annum. This used to be back then. No, this is this I'm talking about 2014, 2014, 15. Okay. I hope you are able to see my screen. Uh, just let me know in the chat if you're able to see. Akash, you're able to see my screen, right? Uh, yeah. Cool. So the 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 good salary. Um, in the industry used to be say about 3.5 lakhs per annum, okay? And this was considered to be on par with the industry standards. But what has happened is when I, okay, I took a decision of moving into consulting because of uh, some personal circumstances where I was not uh, prepared to move into PhD, okay? PhD, I had to invest four years, five years. I actually got opportunities to go abroad, but my personal circumstances restricted me at that time. So 3.5 lakhs per annum um, was the starting salary. And I moved to market research and consulting where I find that folks start with 7 lakhs per annum. Okay. Funny part is for us to move from 3.5 to 7 lakhs per annum, it takes, if you are an exceptionally good candidate, really good candidate, it might take two to three years for you to do this. And how? Not just by a 20% increment. Say you start with a 3 lakh or 3.5 lakhs, and then you have a 20% increment every year. And even after three years, you will stay maybe close to five, but it will not be seven. And normally how this happens is two to three years of experience in one company, and then you shift a company and you seek a hike. And that is where you will land in seven or 7.5. For a lot of us to move to 3.5 to actually eight lakhs per annum, it took quite a while. Okay, but when we were in this, we found that there are folks being recruited, pressures are being recruited at seven lakhs. And then they did what is called as a market correction. So these are all things which you don't need to keep in your mind, but I'm just giving this for your awareness. Then they do something called as market awareness where they match your experience and your capabilities with the standard that they are paying. So there are some companies, let us say your, pack, your current uh, package is say three lakh rupees or four lakh rupees. 
a company comes and recruits you and the company says that in our company for this role we are paying 10 lakh rupees okay it really does not care if you if they are giving you a straight jump from 3 lakhs to 10 lakhs they don't care they just give it sometimes what happens is they may not want to give you more than 100 or 120% high in such case what they do is they take you for 6 lakhs instead ask you to work for one year and the second year they do what is called as a market correction and then they bring it on par with your peers in that company so this happens and why i am saying this is there are plenty of opportunities that you will discover once you start coming out of your uh, shell you know the self created limitations once you start coming out of it you will actually find the possibilities widening up okay a person in a consulting field with say say 10 years of experience is paid anywhere between 25 lakhs to 35 lakhs per annum and this is for really good companies i'm talking about okay i'm not talking about um, ordinary companies but if you're going into a very constrained niche area of a pharma company i'm not consult space but a pharma company people are paid anywhere between 15 lakhs and 20 lakhs and if you are really smart enough if you know how to bargain if you have moved across companies you can actually land in the lower end of this because consulting i am seeing it's it's filled with iim graduates iit graduates and also pharma people from premium institutes okay premium institutes when i say premium institutes i'm talking about naipur iit bhu and such such places so these are the premium people those who are in these consulting companies and that is why their package is higher but if you don't get into those companies it is still fine because you have a way to get there not immediately but after 5 years after 10 years you can take a route but i still feel there are two important levers that you will have to you know leverage the first lever is the institute where you study because of the two advantages the institute where you study gives number one is it gives you know alumni you will have a very very strong alumni that is your senior your super seniors i have seniors who are from 1960s back 1970s back 1980s back 1990s back so on and so forth 2000 back 2010 back okay you have a very strong alumni and you can simply drop a kind mail or an email or a or a or a text if you get their number or they'll come for some conferences they would come for reunions you can just make friends with them okay and you can make friends with them and uh, they will actually be happy to help you and a lot of these folks right they want to do something for their school they want to do something for the college if they want to do something for the junior now for me everybody is equal but i have to give it to somebody and what would i give okay i'll remember that okay my seniors gave it to me and so i would give it to my junior so i go to my school or i go to my college or i go to my post graduation institute and then they, i would i would help them right same way happens with your phd admissions or your job recruitment why do they ask for a reference it's not that if you're really brilliant a reference is not required but generally a reference is something people ask or a reference is something you yourself will voluntarily meet and give see these days linkedin is there so you reach out to people you tell them that you know you are doing this you can tell them that okay can i can i say that i am in touch with you over linkedin can i tell the company that you know i have taken advice from you like this you reach out to people and they tell yes then you go to the company sit for the interview and you actually quote that person i said okay i've been in touch with that person on linkedin i found them on linkedin i have been taking advice from them. if that person with whom you are taking advice on linkedin is close to the company where you are going to join or where you are going to give an interview and they will actually have a uh, take you um, look at you in a very positive way because you have taken the effort to understand the company you have taken the efforts to understand the culture and you have also taken the efforts to go and meet the right people so that they will speak in favor of you and why does the company want to uh, take these references is because it's not that they are going to be partial it doesn't work that way you know companies are very very ethical okay uh, they have lot of ethics they have ethics committee they have they have lot of rules and regulations to follow and the more people are educated the more they start following these things at a ground level okay so it's not very easy to just simply you know uh, give some favor it's not possible because your rank your cap- capabilities are valued much higher then simply favoring somebody because that person if that person is not going to contribute to the company the company will be at a loss and you know today's world everybody is very you know thinking in terms of commercial 
Okay, so they don't want to get into a loss by employing somebody just because they know them and if they are insufficient, inefficient. So your credentials, 90, 80%, 90% weightage of your resume is coming from your credentials, but that 20% is going to come through the reference. Now, I know somebody who's really good, I like them, then I take it. But if I don't know, and everybody, it's an open field, whom am I, whom am I going to recruit? I'll tell you an example of my classmate. Okay, now he's an assistant professor in one of the important universities in Netherlands. Okay, and he published, he, he wrote his first review paper, which got published in Nature. Uh, I, I do not know how many of you are able to um, understand the magnanimity of his success, but Nature is a very prestigious journal. And if you're a scientist or if you're a research student and if your first paper gets published in Nature, it's a really remarkable achievement, right? Nature publishes really, really, you know, good works. Now, so uh, it's not easy to get a publication in Nature. And you know what? He is trying for his PDF under a Nobel laureate. He has written a letter. He's waiting for a response. Um, but, but all said and done. The point what I'm trying to make is he also confronted this task. Now, there are 800 applications that they received for PhD. And the PhD opening is for three people or four people. And it was an international university. So in Europe, um, they had to screen the candidates across the globe. It's not just from Europe. They can screen from other countries within Europe. They can screen from uh, some, some candidates from, from the US and North America, some of them from the Latin American countries, African countries, Eastern countries, that is Australia, Southeast Asian countries, China, Korea, you know, Vietnam, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. All these countries are sending applications. How do they screen? How do they know who's who? And every, country, every person those who are sending would, would have studied in one of the best institutions in their country. You go to the Google and say, okay, oh, best, uh, best institution in Sri Lanka, probably a candidate from there would have applied. Or best institution in India, somebody would have applied from here. What is the basis? So here there is a very simple logic what the professor says is, tell me, do you have any of your college students who have applied here? He directly asks the student. And uh, the PhD candidate says, yes, there's one guy who applied. And he's a sub-junior of mine. And he said, okay, call him for the interview. Now, they just don't take the person like that. But of course, they would give a chance for the interview. If the person, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, Harsh, uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a question that I will, I will, I will take here. I'll pay, bring your attention to that. Uh, give me a little time. Um, so, the, so the point is like, they would then ask their students, because this guy, my classmate, was an exceptional guy. He was brilliant in his PhD and they really liked him. All the professors in Europe liked him. And what they said is, hey, do you have somebody like you? If students from your college or your university are like you, I really like you. And why don't I have a team of such good people who understand the work, who give respect, you know, who are very polite, who are obedient, who are sincere, right? Um, and, and such kind of things and who are really determined to achieve something. And then he recommends his sub-junior. Uh, and what happens is his sub-junior um, gets another offer. He takes it and his junior the next year get that is sub-sub, uh, I mean, it's his junior sub-junior. They, they take the admission and then they go there. And this is very common. It is very common. If, if I have a team and I want a particular characteristic trait in my team, I look up to candidates sometimes for their academic merit, sometimes for their personality. Maybe I'm not very comfortable or my team already has a lot of aggressive people. Okay. I may want to have somebody who is soft. Okay. These are all personality traits come. But sometimes what happens, you're in a dilemma. You want somebody soft, but you want somebody meritorious. Whom do you take? Many times, whatever gives advantage to the business comes first. Um, in a country like India, uh, business comes first. But internationally, um, the people dynamics also play a very, very huge role. Okay. So these are some of the nuances. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is, if you're going to say that, okay, after B Farm, I join a company, they're paying me 20,000 rupees in my life. I've got a pocket money from my father or mother or my relative of 1,000 rupees maximum. I am not able to get, I, I never thought of getting 20, 25,000 rupees a month. It's a great opportunity. Uh, let me go. And if you get stuck in that 25,000, tell me that 25,000 per month, when will it become 2,50,000? How many years it will take if you calculate 10% increment per year or 15% increment per year? And many promotions are given because you have a post-graduation degree, not otherwise. So 
don't get into this don't 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 get inspired by movies and 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 such nonsense life is very different and life is hard i'm telling you the op, the the competition is more brutal than what you think and i am speaking english with you and do you think that this is what we speak every day at home i do you think this is how we speak no you have to bring some changes don't get into don't get into this uh, uh, constrained narrative and thought process so i was just making a presentation it is a is a work in progress though but i thought that it will be useful to you i'll just quickly uh, even harsh's question is somewhere relevant i'll just quickly grab your attention to that and i'll just show you this um Um, yeah. Um, let me know. I think you can see my um, you can see my PPT. Okay. Yeah, I think we're able to see. Let me put it on. able to see my screen yeah so this is a perspective that i just want to quickly bring your attention to on gpac and somebody was asking uh, mba or uh, m uh, such things i'm trying to answer the first point what i would like to bring your attention to is why this m there are two three things one is if i were a recruiter i have 10 years of industry experience and i worked with really sharp minds i've actually had the opportunity to work with really good uh, firms also okay um, i've had international exposure i've ha- i've worked with innovators i i understand uh, with with my experience i understand you know how what it takes and ob- ob- obviously i have 10 years of experience somebody else may have 20 years of experience they know much more than what i do but at least for your level um, or at least for the first 5 years of your career i think i have a very good understanding what is to be done and naturally if you have an 8 or 10 years of experience and come and ask me advice i would rather guide you to somebody who has a 20 years of experience because that would be a better advice than my giving be advice to you but for you i think you can take my word um the first is a value there is a value that is ascribed for your post graduation okay if you are not an m farm i am telling you there is not much of a respect that is given you may be brilliant you may have a lot of knowledge but no sir uh, you know with this brutal competition that we have in our country uh, your m farm kind of adds value it makes life far easier once upon a time maybe my father's generation your father's generation maybe if your parents are very young parents probably your grandparents uh, generation uh, you know in such a case what would happen is they were quite okay to be a graduate a graduate was a big thing because they had opportunities even for 12th pass people being a stenographer i know an income tax officer an income tax inspector who did not graduate but they passed their exam in 1950 60 and then they continued their life like that and they retired as an inspector but today they are saying that had they finished their graduation they would have become an in- income tax commissioner now these things used to happen i mean in my own family so these things happen right uh, so um, and that was the bar so back then graduation was not a minimum criterion it was a good to have but today it has moved from graduation being a good to have to minimum criterion where post graduation is considered to be a really cool thing to do and now post graduation has become very minimum and phd is a cool thing to do or an mba is a cool thing to do or a pg diploma is a cool thing to do so that's how the industry has changed and that's how the scenario has changed because everybody is able to do b farm or they are able to do b tech which are is their graduation bsc everybody is able to do and that is why a post graduation is considered to be minimum you see job openings on linkedin you see job openings on nokri or any any of these places you find m m farm is the minimum criteria half the times the door is not open if you are just a b farm i'm telling you and if i am a recruiter i will not i will not recruit a b farm graduate how much of a brilliant you or she might be you may have studied in the top most top notch college till i would not take you because that is that is not the basic requirement the basic requirement is m farm you are still 
uh, uh, what you can say, um, uh, your your B firm is uh, insufficient. You're underqualified for the job. Uh, okay, but some companies don't want PhDs because they feel they are uh, uh, over. I mean, uh, they are uh, overqualified. But nevertheless, M firm it adds a lot of value. Uh, to be very frank, post graduation adds a lot of value. That is number one. Number two. B farm in itself is becoming very relevant. I just know a handful of people who have done their B farm in BIT, in BIT Spilani. They got a good job and they are still continuing, but they have got into actually a really big companies like Deloitte. They are working there, but they have been told that you better complete your M farm, maybe doing it at a distance. We will support you because you are really, uh, you know, a brilliant guy. Um, a brilliant guy and there were two girls. You are brilliant, three people. Um, you're really brilliant uh, folks. You complete your M-Farm. Probably if there is an option to do distance, you do a distance M-Farm or you do an MBA distance, but become a pro postgraduate so that you'll be eligible for promotion. And after going there, they've started enrolling them. Uh, some of them are lucky enough if the company sponsors. I had a classmate uh, in, in IIT BHU who did M-Farm pharmaceutics as an industry sponsored candidate. And how many seats are there in these central universities for industry sponsor? Just one seat. And their fee structure was expensive. And we used to pay a semester fee of, uh, I don't remember, but it was very, very cheap back then. Back then it was very cheap. Now they have increased the prices, uh, but we paid probably six, 7,000 rupees per semester. Yeah, this was in 2012. And when we joined, um, and uh, she paid at that time 30, 40,000 rupees. So, uh, it was expensive. It is it is 10x the money that you pay, or or at least 8x. So today, if your semester fee is say 50,000 rupees or 60,000 rupees, uh, maybe an industry sponsored uh, candidate will pay. I don't know, maybe maybe one lakh or two lakhs, not one lakh for sure, two lakhs or 2.5 lakhs per semester. So that's the difference. But that industry is bearing that expenditure. You have such opportunities, but very rare. Don't don't um, don't rely on the exception. Right, rely on the mainstream. Okay, rely on the hard work, rely on the normal way of growth, and suddenly you will find an exceptional case coming and helping you out. That's how it happens. The girl who did her industry training, she never thought of industry training and came to that decision, or she got that opportunity. She was just doing her work, and the opportunity came in. Right, and that's how exceptions are made. Nobody works for an exception. You understand that? So keep that in mind. You just work your normal way and exceptions would come and help you. So growing irrelevance of B farm, this is one thing. The two years that you're going to do is not going to add a lot of knowledge, though for some of the institutes, it does add a lot of knowledge. But more importantly, the experience, the sheer wisdom that you get in those two years, I think that is more valued. Uh, people may not necessarily ask, they may ask for a general understanding of to what extent you have done your M farm. They may want to understand what projects you have done. But uh, mostly they will check how you have shaped yourself as a, as a citizen, as a youth, as somebody who has come out of the graduation fold, who is now responsible 23, 24 year olds, what can you do to the society, company, et cetera, et cetera. In those, uh, in those areas that they will start asking questions. Sir was talking about this lady, Pushpa. You see, two, three years back, 2018, five years back, actually she said she had eight years of gap by then. Okay, that is, she finished her B farm in 2010. She's actually senior to me. Okay, and she was much senior. And she said that she got married and she, she probably went into family life and and she was, uh, uh, you know, she was getting along with her life. And then they came to a decision. Her her family, she, they came to the decision that she has to do her M farm. And then surprisingly, she does. She takes her G pad. She gives her uh, Niper, and then she becomes a gold medal. I mean, this is, and I, I know, I know there are a lot of, uh, some of some of my classmates who were married by then. Um, some of them, you know, some of them uh, in my super senior bed, they were mothers by then. It happens. Life is different for each one of us. There is no, there is no one part set. Uh, you know, some of us may come from rich family, some of us may not come from rich family, some of, some of us may have um, a large family, some of us may not have our parents alive. So all these things, these are all different things. I mean, Life is full of different experiences. So you should take just your life into consideration and see what is best for you. There's no need to compare because your life is unique, right? 
So keep that in mind. The two years of experience, what person that you make yourself is very important. Another key point that I would like to add is it is very important both for research and for the industry that from where you have done your post graduation becomes more important than in which subject that you have done. Okay. It really doesn't matter after a certain point of time. Initial days, yes. Maybe if there is a company that would come and say that, uh, um, you know, I want uh, a person from, uh, you know, pharmaceutics, then probably if you have a pharmaceutics background, it becomes advantageous. If you're going to go into a clinical trial company, probably clinical pharmacy, toxicology, or even pharmacology may become more useful to them than they're taking, uh, say, a cognitive person or an analysis person. Uh, but generally, uh, in today's scenario in India, going as a business hub, I am seeing that the differences in terms of recruitment is going up. At least in the industry perspective, uh, what really matters is from where you have done your inform rather than in which subject. There are, as I said, there are exceptions for sure that they may want candidates only from a particular subject. Um, but overall, this this border is getting uh, you know dissolved. Now, why GPAT? Uh, until now, 12,400 was the fellowship. Now, PCI has taken over. And I think that uh, they may come up with, a, at least my hope is that they may come up with even better fellowship uh, for the qualified students this year. Categorically, they have not announced. The expected one is 12,400. But if they have done well, probably next year, uh, with a new central government come, being formed this year, probably they may dole out certain benefits to, to the students. Um, and especially, um, you know, this current scenario with the need, all the doubts that is that is coming up, I think the government, at least it's just my expectation. I mean, <laughs> there's no news anywhere. But psychologically, what I'm seeing is in order to, uh, in order to give that confidence that, you know, we are on top of things, uh, they, may, they may actually come up with committees. They may make the exams more stricter. They may, they may, uh, they may also give some incentives, better incentives to the students to, um, to take formal education. So I, I expect that 12,400 can actually increase next year. That's my personal uh, uh, you know, uh, insight. I mean, uh, observation on this issue. My opinion. Uh, no, no, no news or anything like that. I, I just feel that they may do it. Uh, but fine. Nevertheless, it's going to stay twelve thousand four hundred otherwise. What I'm saying is, per month, if you're going to get twelve thousand four hundred, it's 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 like how much? One point five lakhs approximately per annum. Your semester fee probably would be sixty, seventy thousand, or even seventy five. You know, if you're going to go to a different say a state or a city and live. Um, a large part of your expenditure uh, is taken care of by your fellowship. If if your parents are able to arrange for your fee, your all the other expenditures of living is taken care of by your fellowship. Okay. Uh, some of you in these days, I'm seeing that, especially after COVID, a lot of you have your laptops. But you know, all of us, we bought our laptop with our first fellowship. We used to pool the money. That in our class, there are 10 people, 10 new people put their first month stipend. Uh, it used to become 80,000 rupees. Okay, at that time we had 8,000 rupees fellowship per month. Uh, and out of that 80,000 rupees, uh, two people will go and buy their laptop. The next month, their fellowship, they put it there. So like this, we used to do this rotation basis and everybody by the end of six months, seven months, uh, we used to make sure that, uh, you know, we had our laptops in place. So, uh, I mean, you'll, you'll find all these things. The second thing is like, you know, the large part of your expenditure is self-financed. Uh, during your recruitment, Especially in your first recruitment, if you're a GPAC qualified candidate, there's a weightage given to you, right? And even for PhDs, your GPAC uh, qualification uh, becomes a essential thing. Um, yeah, during, you know, screening process, GPAC qualification adds weight to your resume, right? And also, when you're looked looked up for uh, promotions, uh, many times what happens is uh, people want to take candidates with a good rank. Okay, so rank becomes important but the first step is qualification but i'm telling you if you are if you are ambitious and if you are really uh, really determined to work sincerely and work hard i'm telling you top 100 rank is not a very difficult task okay but you need to be very dedicated to it right not not get distracted unnecessarily it's a very simple straight uh, formula uh, have self control have self confidence and you do well that's it um, you don't have to complicate life uh, but if you're getting a top GPAT rank, what happens is, as I said, from where you're getting recruit, uh, from where you're completing your GPAT becomes more important than in which subject you are doing, right? So you will first have the opportunity to choose the institution of your choice. 
okay maybe i may want to go to iit bihar i may want to go to naipur mohali yeah i may want to go to naipur hyderabad or i want to do in ict mumbai or i want to do in any one particular uh, you know institution so wherever i want to go the choice would be in my hand because people will welcome you right on top of it you also will have obviously the chance of choosing your subject because you are the top ranker so you get a double advantage of choosing the subject of your choice of your interest and also the institute well um, some of the institutes would like to conduct their own uh, examination like after qualifying gpat uh, only you will be eligible to take admission in naipur and again based on your naipur rank uh, they will decide um they will decide you know which course you are eligible with and that 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 autonomy is given by the central government to these institutes so they may conduct so in iit bhc sometimes they didn't conduct sometimes they conduct sometimes they say 75% for your gpat 25% for interview sometimes they say 50% gpat 25 for their test and 25 for interview there was one year where it was 75% gpat 25% for their test it's up to them it's up to them they have the autonomy to uh, choose and give rank the way they want in bits i remember there was one of a, one on one of my students um she um she went into bits so bits gave an option at that time would you like to have take the admission based on your bits rank after giving the entrance exam or would you like to uh, enroll to take admission based on your gpat rank and that year she had a gpat rank of 123 okay and her name was mansi she is from delhi and she said uh, sir uh, uh, i checked with uh, 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 the bits authorities they said that it's not best of the two that is if you choose i mean this was at that time scenario i'm not really uh, confident with whether this is still prevalent but at that time uh, she said that if i give the test then it will be based on the test but i already have a good rank and uh, i feel that uh, when people are taking into naipur and other institutes i stand a chance uh, and i want to get into this what i feel that i want to simply give based on my gpat rank and not based on the test i said i mean that's up to you uh, 123 i still would say that you know it's still a risky zone uh, because under 100 is fine anything above 100 uh, you should be very careful in these things and she was confident she did her maths she did her calculation and then she got uh, she actually got uh, uh, pharmaceutics and uh, she got pharmaceutics uh, in bits and uh, it so strangely happened that lot of those folks uh, you already have a good rank what they did is they said they will give by the entrance test and and they gave entrance test in bits they gave entrance test in naipur and a whole host of them went and joined naipur at that time so she was still having a, a pharmaceutics opportunity in the second counseling in the first counseling she got uh, chemistry and then people left the seat and they joined other institutions and then she was able to get the last seat in uh, in physics uh but but these are all uh, some of the things you know 123 sometimes it works in my batch the last rank uh from uh general category was 90 90 and the last rank after the reservation was taken into consideration was 120 that's it so there's not much of a difference and if you have a reservation certainly you have to leverage it utilize it it's a good opportunity okay and uh, you should utilize to the maximum a study sincerely okay and you should work hard so it's a good thing that we have these systems to you know collectively uh, uh, encourage as a society for all sections of people to go up it's a very good thing so if you have it you have to uh, work hard if you don't have it still you have to work hard so anyway hard work will will pay a lot right a uh, few things i would like to also highlight is your m farm supersedes your b farm that is b farm let us say you have done in the top university but m farm you did it in a very small university somewhere okay your m farm is only going to be looked at they will say that you did m farm from the small place even if you have done your b farm in the top university it doesn't matter much it only matters where you have done your m farm so be very careful if you are already in a very good college try to get into a college which is equivalent to that and preferably better than that um so that is a very important thing your m farm degree from where you have done supersedes completely where you have done your b farm because they don't care uh, and as i said m farm sets it gives a value to you b farm if you even don't do still don't get doesn't give you a value right you may do it from a very top university but still if you are just a b farm you just a b so that's how it is being looked at some companies 
may want a subject of their choice okay and some of them in consulting what holds true is uh, they would want uh, an mba candidate now somebody asked this question uh, so here what happens is the mba angle is very true uh, today's uh, world especially is more moving towards the business side of things and healthcare and pharma is not an exception there uh, they also want mbas they want people to understand um, pharma and also an mba i'll tell you an example uh, when i was working in one of these big companies um, i tell big companies because it's actually a big company and there there was this guy from iim kori kod okay this iim guy he was given a very simple task you know what he had to do he had to do some forecasting uh, forecasting in the sense today uh, uh, the, the the sale or a revenue of a particular product today of a company is x what would be its revenue in 5 years or 6 years whatever was the task and this forecast that he has to do it's, it's not a, it's not a joke it's not a small exercise it's a very big thing but the first step of this forecasting is they wanted him to segregate the molecules it was for a pharma company they wanted our team to segregate the molecules based on their therapeutic category okay all of you who are there in this particular session if i were to ask you where would you put oseltamivir okay Os oseltamivir where would you put oseltamivir and zanamivir where would you put any 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 answers anybody knows this oseltamivir and zanamivir um um no oseltamivir zanamivir all these virs are uh, uh, antiviral right these are all antiviral fair enough and then the next question next drug was uh, uh budesonide okay so budesonide anyone yeah rt it is antiviral budesonide uh, uh, yeah asthma but apart from asthma it is also used in conditions like crohn's disease ulcerative colitis because it's a surface acting steroid right so it's also used in other inflammatory conditions where there is no requirement of absorption of the drug okay so when there is ulcerative colitis um, and uh, there is uh, crohn's disease uh, budesonide is also given now this guy unfortunately is a very sharp and brilliant person but what was the task in front of him to segregate the molecules how many how many seconds it took lata or akash or uh, uh, who was the rt right you know how many seconds you took probably this segregation you would do in 5 seconds 10 seconds let us say 30 seconds right uh, you know poor guy he has never heard about this word he is going to google and searching and first he types the spelling wrong and then he looks at it and he tries to check you know what is this oseltamivir and he starts reading the wikipedia page and it is so complicated especially for budesonide he got so confused he says this is asthma and they are saying this is colitis what is all these things i don't understand but if you ask him to do give numbers and do forecast nobody will be able to do at that time like him but the first step itself he got very much stunned because these names are growing and today's world is full of cancer and if you start looking at the new drugs that are coming the pronunciation of these names are itself very difficult for those folks unfortunately he did he did his engineering and he did mba and he has joined a company where they are doing uh, you know consulting for uh, healthcare and they have this task and at that time you know what the manager said is no we have to recruit people who have done their pharma and also did their mba and that is where these kind of things start coming your mba becomes very important because if you get into fields where you understand business and pharma in such cases your mba becomes very valuable but unfortunate part here is people are getting into mba careers today the pharma companies are recognizing the value of mba but all the mbas who are coming from pharma you know they are going into marketing they are going into other things they are not able to do the accounts related mba the accounts mba where there is heavy on mathematics uh, and the proper mba by giving cat and you know the folks do those who get into iim their understanding of business is far deeper than the ones who have done their b farm and then they have joined most of these folks are in marketing side and in marketing side such such accounting details are not required and that is a balance that is being struck in the industry for now 
but what i'm afraid is after a certain point of time there may not be much of a value that is what is 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 my worry but at that time you know you may have other opportunities opening so mba is a good option actually but there are some who want to do their mfarm and they get into a career where suddenly they will start becoming important in the company okay they start becoming managers they start becoming uh, you know senior consultants assistant managers managers senior manager they start growing and once they hit a certain level like a managerial post what happens is they have to start understanding the business that is they start they have to they become part of what is called as the billing process okay they start understanding what is the resource that they have how many people are working under them what is their salary how much they are being paid how much is the cost to the company how much is the project worth how much is the time that is put for this project am i going to give 6 months to a project which is going to worth about say say 10 crores versus you know 6 months to a project which is worth 100 crore probably i will give uh, time more to the 100 crore value and if i am going to give such high huge stakes project i don't want some random guy or girl sitting in my team i want really top notch people because i want to really impress so that again i will get another 100 crore business and i'm talking in such big numbers because most of these companies have their clients in the us uh, and they really pay if it's an innovator company they really pay well for the companies i mean you are not going to get 100 crore but the company gets and what they do is they kind of uh, employ a lot of people they invest in technology they invest in so many other things and they start expanding their company one center is there now they have moved they have created another center and like that they keep expanding this is how the business model works and many times it's an fte based model that is a full time employment based model where two or three people will be full time employees of a company they'll be paying they'll be given a very high uh, salary structure but they'll be charged in the us standard rest of us standards they'll be charged but they only three people will be charged but when you convert it into indian rupees that three people will be equivalent to 30 people salary and that is how companies also uh, will manage the money and they run because if they are going to say that you pay all the 30 people the us guy also will say boss what is this we cannot pay so much because they also have a cap so that's how the indian market is generally growing because when you convert that dollar to rupee value there is a lot of benefit that you get so um, so there is there is an advantage uh, for the rupee not uh improving in in this context though it has to improve what i'm saying is uh, generally uh, a perceptional uh, advantage is there which may not be actually a true advantage but nevertheless uh, companies work in this manner and mbas pretend but uh, you have to be very careful that if you are not understanding the business then your marketing mba will take you to all sorts of things uh, you may get lost okay so you have to be very careful i know people who have done hospital mba okay who work closely with hospitals hospital management etc uh, etc et uh, so this is this is one group but there are a lot of people who do their m farm and after having done their m farm what they do is they take a one year uh, pg diploma that is a post graduate diploma in business and in fact that is actually a very good alternative for a lot of folks because they have done their b farm m farm and also one year of pg diploma in business management and uh, such candidates are really viewed with a lot of respect uh, and a lot of knowledge and if they are able to really Uh, do the degree not just for the sake of the degree, but to understand what the business management is. Uh, they are they are really paid very well, and they are also sought after. Uh, then there is uh, the abroad view. Okay, a lot of you guys may want to do your MS abroad. Some of them may take yeah CAT. There's one guy. Uh, see IIT BHU is an IIT BHU. It's IIT, right? So you find 50% of the pharma seats reserved to uh the neat aspirants or the uh, aipmt aspirants at that time and 50% to the jee aspirants so you have a you have a class of half with biology background and half with mathematics background. a guy who came from the mathematics background he took b farm and then he cleared gpat and took m farm and then he realized that uh, his interest more lied in business side and he was so confident in himself that he gave cat and he cleared it and went and joined um, iim guwahati Uh, i think guwahati or one of these uh, in the northeastern side or kolkata so he he joined there i think i am kolkata he joined there and he finished this uh, mba properly with accounts etc etc so he has two post graduate degrees he spent time yeah well there are people who are ready to spend time in their studies they give more but i would still say that you know smarter route would be to finish your mfarm and probably after you join your work do your one year pg diploma that would be a better uh, thing i feel but if you have it in you and if you want to do the regular mba well fair enough just do it i know a colleague of mine a colleague of mine 
uh, was a doctor from Ames, Delhi, and he was an IIM from Ahmedabad. And this guy is now working in uh, uh, some government sector. Uh, they have taken him as an employee. He didn't clear the civils, but he went as an employee uh, because he's a really knowledgeable guy. He's a doctor and also an IIM. I said, very few people are there like that, you know, who are really brilliant. Um, and not just doctor from some, some university. He's doctor from the most prestigious university. So there are people who do these kind of things. Um, some people, they may not, they may realize much later in their life that probably their interest lies somewhere. They have put their efforts in one direction, but suddenly they find some other direction opening up for them and they may like it. I personally feel, you know, MBBS doctors probably should put more time on uh, on diagnosis and research. That is my take. But again, it's all individualistic. Um, just like I move from core research to consulting, people move. Uh, people just move. And these people have done much better than what I've done, probably. Um, maybe their, their, their vision is totally different than what I have, probably. I mean, anything is possible. But there is no need to judge yourself because opportunities open up. Uh, you may not really want to say that I'm good, I'm bad. This kind of conversation will, will dissolve after a certain point of time because nobody knows who's smart and who's not. There's a, there's a talent or there's a, there's a flair within you which suddenly you will recognize that, hey, I am actually suitable there more. And I get into that space and I really shine and I become one of the, one of the best uh, in, that, in that niche. All the while, I was a very average guy probably and suddenly I realize something and I become the best there. And everybody starts giving me respect, and I realize that hey, I'm actually one of the one of the best uh, in, the, in the country. So these kind of things happen, right? If you are going to if you're going to measure your success based on a certain yardstick, that in that yardstick you may actually find others doing quite well, and you yourself may not be doing quite well. But in some other yardstick, probably you're doing much better than most of the others. So try to understand where your strengths are. Uh, don't go blindly by this uh, glamour, okay? Don't go by this glamour of this company, that company, all these things. But certainly do go, uh, uh, do be practical, okay? Uh, maybe you can get into a company and try to find a niche for yourself. Uh, and also, most importantly, go with the glamour of universities. Huh? Where you do your MFAM is very important. Whatever I am talking is, I am talking after 10 years of watching uh, firsthand and uh, into all these things. And by the way, I have been observing students ever since I completed my MFAM. In fact, even in, when I was in B from fourth year, I was I was given a lecture to to teach the third year B farm. So I, I really love this this explanation, the storytelling, this this uh, this teaching. Um, so my my professor used to encourage, and uh, in M farm I didn't do except for one session where I took on uh, uh, neurotoxic uh, chemicals. Uh, but but ever since I finished my M farm, I started uh, you know teaching during my free time. When I was in Delhi, I taught in my free time to students uh, in the weekends, uh, whenever I could take time. Um, um, and and when I was in uh, in Maharashtra, I I started taking some online uh, classes uh, um, uh, to, with the, with the friends I knew, um, and that's how uh, I've I've been associated uh, with uh, with education and with students. And I'm telling you, when I finished my MFarm, I was a 24 year old, a 23, 24 year old. And the guys who were sitting there, they're 22 years old, probably one year younger to me, or 23, one year younger. If I don't teach properly, they'll start commenting, and you know that. Uh, if it's if it's not interesting, they'll start killing you. But you'll have to really hold the class, strength of 80, 60, 100. It used to be offline class, batch one, batch two, whatever. So you have to be really very clear in what you're saying. You have to be very, uh, very interested in what you're saying, and you should not just give it up. Uh, because it can get challenging. But of course, the students, I, what I realized personally is that once you start understanding people and once you actually get into the psychology of students who are taking coaching, uh, what I'm saying is they're serious. And that seriousness will come if the teachers are serious and your friend circles are, is serious. I can very clearly see in a classroom, which is the group, and you may make friends with your, with your colleagues or I mean, uh, with your classmates. But if you make friends with those who are also serious, I think that is that that environment is going to push you further. I have a classmate of uh, not a classmate. I have a friend of mine who's called as who who got introduced to me, Chandra Shekhar, um, who's who's a totally different college, and we just simply discussed only one thing. We used to discuss about exam. I was not very great in statistics. He was not very great in ecology, and I understood I was good at ecology. 
and he understood he was good at stupidity and what we used to do is on phone calls he simply used to explain me the concepts of stupidity i used to explain him the concepts of college like this what happened he polished our understanding there's a competition he's my competitor but we worked together and you know what that guy he got uh he was a very brilliant guy and nobody knew how he did not get a very good rank in gpac but both of us knew that uh, it's it's not his true potential so he said uh, uh, upendra i have to go and give my uh, give my sniper because that's that's my last resort with my rank i may not get in a good university but by then i got into iit bh and then he gave uh, he gave sniper and he got all india 72 rank and uh, he took for my mba by the way and uh, at that time mba was based on group discussions and large amount of it was given to rank uh, weightage was given to rank uh, so it happened sometimes your true worth is manifested somewhere else in G- gbat also he is capable of getting in top 100 for sure because i know he's a very brilliant guy something happens sometimes it happens so that is why you know on the day of exam what strategy you adopt um, how are you going to plan uh, you know what is your frame of mind all these things matter whether you eat if you overeat you may have a tendency to go to you know go to toilet uh, you drink more water you may have the tendency to go to toilet you eat more and probably something doesn't agree with you uh, you start having loose stools how difficult it is these are all practical things we experience right you're sitting in the exam hall suddenly you want to go to toilet because of loose and the exam is about to start you go the invigilator will uh, will agree you go but your 5 10 minutes is wasted on top of it you start getting tense now my 10 minutes is wasted what do i do so so avoid all these things eat light food and what i what the best suggestion is this entire year have proper sleep have good company don't watch these uh, worst movies third rate movies please don't watch any of those things and the more i'm watching the trailers the more i'm seeing that day by day the movies are becoming worse and worse don't get distracted by all this nonsense okay even the songs and their lyrics are also becoming worse and worse day by day so i would rather uh, advise you to just focus on your studies have good company good people around you mm-hmm. have big ideals you see the youth of the country who can contribute to the welfare of the nation is between 80 and 40 so 80 and 40 is the prime time where you should think big what you can do in your life what you can do for the society what you can achieve okay maybe you may be a little bit uh, egoistic or selfish but on a positive side you in order to become self confident sometime you may you may realize that you have become egoistic but you should give that up because if you become arrogant in life you go so high and you fall you fall so hard that you know it becomes very difficult to get up so better not to become arrogant or egoistic but you can be wise enough to understand what life is and don't get distracted unnecessarily so that is one thing so there are options of you going abroad uh, there are people who take uh, foreign pharmacy exams uh, there is naplex there is pbc there are some of these exams where they take admission in australia canada us etc etc um and there are people who give uh, uh, you know gre and ielts examination for their english comprehension so all these things are options that you have uh, but be very clear with what is the requirement and accordingly apply and if you are really interested go for it otherwise uh, you know stick to the common route um i have folks i know folks who have uh, you know uh, who have taken a phd uh, after b pharm directly i know a btech uh, girl who has taken phd in the us after her btech straight away there are these options and even all the top universities they do have admission in phd based on your b pharm but that's an exceptional one if you get an opportunity don't leave it that is number one another thing is you should remember in mind places like iit madras places like other iits iit bombay i'm not sure whether it has biochemical or biomedical engineering uh, some of these biochemical allied fields of healthcare they actually take m uh, b farm students for m tech courses based on the gpat rank so keep your options open keep your mind open right so iit madras also i remember offers in their biochemical engineering department for their m tech they welcome students with gpat rank so you can actually try that they may they may there is these are called as integrated studies they may want people from different backgrounds so that their projects can be contributed better so keep that in mind then there are people who prepare for state and central di but again i would say these exams will keep happening you can keep preparing if that is your ambition but that doesn't stop you from doing your gpat and your mpharm i have a classmate called as pitam his name is pitambar sahu and this guy is from chatisgarh we finished our first year in mpharm 
and in the second year there was a notification that came for chatisgarh drug inspector examination and this guy second year was project work he went and spoke to his professor saying sir i am willing to um, sir i am willing to write this exam can you let me not work properly for next one month that's what he said he said i will i will give my attendance but my focus will be more on preparing examination may i have your permission very sincere there the professor understood and he says only one month <laughs> you know because you cannot do these kind of things it's just that uh, the professor was kind enough and you know how he studied day and night this guy studied and he didn't uh, he he didn't want to get disturbed so he went to the lab and studied by the way in all these universities labs are open 24 hours okay uh, let us say if you are a chemistry guy you are doing some reaction sometimes you may have to put a 16 hour reaction what do you do you cannot switch off the lab and come that reaction will be going on so you will have to go from your hostel to check how the reaction is going on all niper bhu bit the labs are open 24 hours okay so there is good internet connection i in bhu we had what was called as the central library huge library and next to it there was also a, a digital center that got started which was an air conditioned one open 24 hours so all these guys who were preparing for other exams or doing these regular studies used to go there and sit and this guy also sat sometimes in his lab or went to the digital center he sat there um and then he just studied some 16 hours a day 14 hours a day um uh, he just studied and then uh, he got uh, i think uh, he got uh, first rank or second rank in that exam and there were three posts and the government announced that all the three recruitment will be based on merit that's it that's it which means that interview will be a formality not a major one but they want to ensure that the candidate is good so the a formal interview will be there but uh, the admission is based on that. this guy became drug inspector when he was doing his uh, first semester in the second year uh, in mfarm so he had to drop out uh, and he had to be joined there but he was given an option to complete mfarm in the next four years right take a sabbatical that is take a one year leave uh, from your company or your job come and do your mfarm and go back uh, so th- that was his story so there are people who do this and you may get this idea much later maybe you join a company suddenly you feel that no you have to become a, a you know a central di maybe suddenly you find fascination for it um, or you may want to write the upsc exam there, there are folks who do that um, i know a guy from niper who who joined there and then who uh, gave his uh, groups he cleared and uh, he wanted to become a civil servant so so, th- so it happens i mean the, as i said in life as you keep advancing opportunities will open up for that you have to advance for that you have to clear the first step only if you finish your class 6 properly then you will face the class 7 hurdles but if you sit in class 6 and keep brooding over the difficulties that you will face in class 7 class 8 class 9 class 10 nothing is it's not also of no help you will not be able to progress new challenges new ideas new avenues will start opening up as you make progress in life so keep this in mind okay and uh, these are some of the points that uh, i i just wanted to share so when it comes to uh, your um mfarm versus mba uh, i would i would i would certainly suggest that uh, you uh, you take a voice call it's up to you both are good but make sure that you just don't do from somewhere uh, you just rather do from good institutes and good uh, uh, good places pharma mba is an option uh which is being given by bits manipal um niper nmims there is an rc munji university which is in mumbai um so uh, so the, these are some of the things you know which uh, uh, which offer mba to pharma students i know this year a guy from uh, um i think uh, ramachandra medical college chennai uh, there's a college of pharmacy from there he joined narsim munji institute of management sciences in mumbai uh, he took mba course there and then he joined uh, in one of the companies in mumbai see what is happening today is uh, people are going regional 60% and national 40% what i mean to say is if a company if a consulting firm is uh, the hub is located let us say in pune of maharashtra they start recruiting people from pune college of pharmacy the pune university of management i mean pune university pune institute of management sciences 
Mumbai College of Pharmacy, um, any, any other university in Mumbai. So what happens is in and around that local area, some good prestigious places, they start recruiting people from there because they have good candidates. Some 60% uh, uh, population will come from there and 40% they open it, you know, through LinkedIn, now free platform where they can join anywhere from the country. Why they are doing it? Because they get fast, immediate join, number one. Relocation will not be a constraint. They will not think, oh, I am in Hyderabad. Should I go to Mumbai? Should I go to Delhi? All these kind of confusions will not be there. The, the, a local guy will think, guy or girl will join. So with these advantages, practically what they're doing is the 60-40 formula. But it's not a rule. Some people are adopting this. But the interesting part is, the guys, those who are joining, let us say a guy is joining from uh, uh, Pune, uh, say some from, from Pune College of Pharmacy. Okay, the guy from Pune College of Pharmacy might be a Telugu guy or a Tamil guy or a Malayali guy because he would have got a GPAT rank and joined that institute. Okay, if they're recruiting folks from ICT Mumbai, ICT Mumbai has a GPAT rank. The guy would have joined there from some other state, but the recruitment is happening locally from that institute. So same way, depending on whatever is uh, in the proximity, sometimes the recruitment is happening. So that is why, what I would again suggest is be open to the idea of traveling, be open to the idea of exploring other parts of the country. Uh, this country is so huge, the culture is so vast, there are so many things, the food habits, the weather, everything is different. Language, of course, you know. Uh, in the south, we know that we go, uh, you know, we go uh, five, six hundred kilometers on one direction, the language changes. Um, and uh, we are more used to um, uh, the change in the language. In the northern side of the country, they're not much used to the change in language because everybody speaks Hindi with a different dialect. But here, totally different languages we speak. On one side, Telugu, one side, Tamil, one side, Malayalam, one side, Kannada, uh, Uriya on the east, so like this, and Chhattisgarh start Hindi. So we know this kind of a, a, a thing. But these days, what is happening is when people start moving uh, to different places, everybody has started accepting that everybody is different. And that, that, that has become very common now. So people welcome each other. Everybody welcomes everybody else. So it's become very common. Uh, so if you go to some place and you don't know Hindi, they very well understand that, oh, okay, you don't know Hindi. Fair enough. And if some guy comes here and speaks only in Hindi, we know very well that, okay, he doesn't understand our language. Here. It has become very common, so nothing to worry. A lot of people are going to different parts and studying. Um, uh, the institutions are understanding the dynamics and the temperaments, the backgrounds. In fact, professors understand the psychology of students, some people may come from a village background. They may, they may not know a lot of things. Their behavior could be a very odd one. And I'm telling you, just imagine this. A, a person coming from a very humble family from a village gets a GPAT and goes into some prestigious university. And, he, and that is in the heart of a city. And you have all these guys from, from city-bred people. Um, adjusting itself becomes a tough thing the language, the culture, the expenditure, the kind of dressing, you know, the way to go about talking, all these things, uh, you know, it, it, would be, uh, it would be very difficult. That is why professors ensure that they understand each of the students and they go about, you know, taking. And I know there are universities which call experts to adjust the attitudes of teachers and professors with the new generation coming. Right, I belong to the millennial generation. Probably you belong to Gen X, um, or Gen Z, whatever you call it. And and, and there is a generational gap. Uh, and my seniors, or even my uncles and uh, my father and uncles and others, their thought process was different. Mine is different, and probably yours is totally different. And probably your lingos, I don't understand what you're talking. So this psychological shift is something people are getting adjusted to, and everybody welcomes everybody. Right? Um, women are given equal place than men. Nobody, nobody stopped. There is no restrictions. And girls, I encourage you to go everywhere. And boys, many of them don't sit in your own, uh, you know, fantasy world. Just start exploring out, both boys and girls, I'm saying. Um, there are a number of opportunities. And you should work with different kind of people. You should have managers, both men and women, to understand the different way in which they see uh, the same situation. And this is a big learning for all of us. If, if your manager is a mother, then her thinking is totally different uh, than if, if he is still a bachelor. Similarly, a father, in the sense like he has his family and he is he's a father of children, then his thinking becomes very diff different. Um, and if he is just a young man who is not yet married, his thinking will be different. Uh, a calm introvert will have a certain view, an extrovert will have a certain view. You have all these dynamics happening. 
internationally people are welcoming races that is the eastern people the the uh, the colored americans the white americans uh, the spanish uh, the mexican the europeans within europe there are different people from different parts the british the non british um, people from japan so so and people from southeast asia so 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 the world is looking at at people from different representations to come and within our country also the ideas that that we need to have people always a mixture and this extends to the subjects also you may be a pharma guy tomorrow they may want a pharma guy in some field which doesn't which does with healthcare but they don't understand well and they want you to join their firm and pick up their skills and that's what happened to me i was joined in a totally different kind of a consulting space and they wanted me to pick up their business insights and understand and i did it so so many people will get opportunity so like this you have to keep in mind for all these opportunities the most fundamental point is your knowledge number 1 number 2 how do you study how do you prepare and what do you talk to yourself what are you telling yourself that you are a loser or that you are able to succeed right that you should be a good person a good citizen a good child to your parents or are you going to think arrogantly who is your ideal are you going to be the likes of abdul kalam or swami vivekananda or any of these big achievers in life or are you going to simply keep some 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 fantasy figure which you see in movies which is not even true so so just 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 see where you are taking your life and nobody comes to help you nobody will help you it is only you who should help you right your connection with yourself is most important and there is god if you are a believer in god there is every every sacred text says god is within your heart again you have to make connection there again it is within you there is nobody who can come all these are just platforms all these things are just to make you uncover the best within you right i can teach you you know there is a saying in english that you can only take the horse to the river but you cannot make the horse drink the water you see it is the horse is only only the horse can drink water you can only take it to the river the same kind of thing happens here that uh, you should be very careful in what you are doing your psychology is important and that is why this year in gpat what we are trying to do uh shankar sir and myself what we are trying to do is we have some good industry contact and what we want to do is in the weekends that is one every saturday preferably we want to ask you to join the sessions where a, pers- a perspective of the industry is given to you what are the disruption so that by the time you give your gpat and start taking admission into your post graduation you have an awareness of what are the possibilities it may not be all but at least it is better than what you currently have and and we want to have these expert interview sessions and we also want motivational sessions because what i am seeing is it is very important for the country to have people with ideals not people who are cowards not people who are scared not people who are selfish and just thinking about their own um, their own life their uh, you know their money their wealth not willing to even share anything with anybody else insecure scared timid this kind of this kind of a thing seems to be getting developed which we don't want and also uh, which we don't want in the sense which we feel is not really great for the society and your lives are around your social social media okay and uh, that's a it's a very silly thing to thing to do okay so don't give too much importance on 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 things that distract okay don't uh, uh, you know just just make a person out of yourself make a good citizen out of yourself and our, our collective effort is towards that direction so this is the background i would like to take uh, some 10 15 minutes getting into the subject uh, it's it's probably 10 to 1 uh, but i'll i'll just take some time in getting into the subject to give you a flavor of uh, how things would be uh, when you are preparing for gpat and the exam is easy 2024 some questions i saw it is easy but what is more important for for us is you first get the subject right because we are inviting the industry people because we are seeing the industry we have seen industry we have academicians in the center so we 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 understand a little bit better that where is the disconnect we are trying our best to make you understand where the dis- disconnect is and i tell you you are too young to understand because you have not seen anything how much ever i describe to you how let us say shringwerpur is okay i am not sure how many of you have gone to shringwerpur how much ever i describe it's a small town where i had a chance of looking at it so if i try to tell you where shringwerpur is how it is you will not be able to understand if you go there then you will be able to relate much better so how much ever we try it is just an attempt to make you imagine better than 
you know what your current understanding is. it's it's just that attempt okay so uh, and then one more thing is when you join we will have our counselors and everybody talking i want you to take responsibility of it okay and i want you to uh, join with the intention of achieving something and working with yourself um, and we will teach you the subject uh, not just how to crack gpat it's not just that it, it it's 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 a, it's a bit more than that from a subject perspective and it's much more than that from a personality perspective just just keep that in mind having said this um, let me just quickly uh, give you a few pointers probably uh, on the direction in which we can discuss um i see this one one interesting question that had come is a very common question that which nerve is associated with the heartbeat was a question which was given it's a very simple question but i just want you to understand something in deeper this is not the accurate description of the heart but i am just drawing it for the for ease okay use your imagination here okay so this is the heart um you see this from the heart what happens is i'll just write the path here this is your left ventricle uh, left atrium this is your right atrium okay there is somewhere on top here this is your sinoatrial node this is your left ventricle sorry right yes right ventricle and this is your left ventricle okay. there is a valve here which is called as the tricuspid valve and there is a valve here which is called as the mitral valve or your bicuspid valve okay mitral valve um you see the interesting thing is whatever the blood vessels so heart is filled with blood okay whatever the blood vessels that come to the heart okay whatever blood vessels that come to the heart are called as veins let me show you uh, one example let us say there is a cell here the cell undergoes a lot of processes okay one of the important processes is glycolysis okay this glycolysis what it does is in the presence of oxygen okay in the presence of oxygen it gives pyruvic acid is the background in the absence of oxygen it gives lactic acid that's the difference so this pyruvic acid undergoes in krebs cycle okay or citric acid cycle and ultimately generate atp atp is energy okay atp is produced in the process of producing atp as part of krebs cycle within the cell all these things are happening what happens is it releases carbon dioxide now this carbon dioxide which is released as part of cellular function okay it's part of internal cellular function the carbon dioxide some amount of carbon dioxide is used up in the body okay they they are being it is being used up like for example water plus carbon dioxide let us say it will form uh, carbonic acid and which will further break down to uh, hco3 minus which is carbonate or bicarbonate plus h plus okay so if you look at h2co3 which is carbonic acid and then this is bicarbonate there is a certain degree of basicity that is content this is eliminated from the body we'll come to this much later this basicity is added to the blood and this acts as a buffer and the ph of blood is maintained at uh, 7.4 okay is the ph of blood and this carbon dioxide which is released generally across every cell is used up in this manner and then many ways many reactions and many ways it is used up but a large part of it is just in excess the excess amount of carbon dioxide which is being generated now it is considered as a waste material your waste material from the body comes out through feces after the food you take or after the water or liquids you take it comes out as urine or it comes out as sweat okay some amount of it also comes out as gas and one very important waste material in this case is carbon dioxide now this carbon dioxide is generated within this cell like this every cell in the body generates Okay. so it is generated within the cell now interestingly what happens is it gets generated from the cell and this carbon dioxide enters into very thin 
very very thin blood vessels called as capillaries okay so there are capillaries which take in this carbon dioxide and uh, what does capillaries contain basically they contain blood here so this carbon dioxide from the cell enters into the capillaries which contain blood now the capillaries what happens is they start coming out of the cell and they start becoming slightly big in size when they become slightly bigger we call this as venule okay we call it as venule so this venule which comes out is slightly bigger now it is containing blood and the blood is the blood here contains what the venule contains blood and the blood here contains what anyone blood here contains what what does the blood contain here yeah blood plus carbon purnima very good it contains basically carbon dioxide right because this carbon dioxide is coming from the cell into this particular blood so this blood vessel becomes slightly larger we call it as venule becomes slightly even more larger okay and then we call this as vein and then all the veins come together and become even bigger in size and they dump this blood in the in the right atrium and these large blood vessels are called as vena cava okay vena cava so there are three vena cava okay superior inferior and another other blood vessels coming from the heart itself all these will bring this blood which is a rich in carbon dioxide and they dump this entire blood into this right atrium now this right atrium is filled with this blood which is rich in carbon dioxide now the interesting point is you see you observe here the blood vessel which is moving from the tissue or a cell or a tissue to the heart are collectively called as vein you simply give a common name as vein it could be vein you will vena cava okay or a vein but we simply refer to them as vein so the moment somebody talks about a vein we are talking about the blood flowing into the heart you understand this whenever there is a blood that flows into the heart we are talking about that blood vessel as a vein and generally it contains carbon dioxide rich blood so this blood comes into the right atrium and what happens to the heart is the function of the heart we can see all these things much in detail the electrophysiology of the heart the cell uh, the contraction of the heart uh, the processes physiology all these things we'll see uh, this time i think we will go a little bit deep on the anatomy also but for now um, to for a simpler understanding this is how the heart is let us say at a state of rest the different color uh, let us move great So this is how the heart is, okay? Atria and ventricles. Just a simple understanding. What happens first is the atria contract, okay, and send the blood to ventricles. So the ventricles are in the state of relaxation. Then what happens? The atria start relaxing, okay, and the ventricles contract, right? And in the next, both atria and ventricles relax. See this? the first step is relaxation of both atrial contraction ventricular relax uh, ventricular contraction and atria starts relaxing then atrioventricular relaxation the relaxation happens in such way that atria completes its relaxation ventricles are completing its relaxation and the next atrial contraction sets in and the ventricles are already relaxed and again blood flow this is the way in which the contraction of the heart happens so when there is an atrial contraction what happens this blood which is rich in um carbon dioxide it because of the pressure it does not go back there is a hole here because it is through this hole this blood is coming in but it doesn't go back rather what happens is there is a hole here which is called as the valve valve opens up um for a simpler understanding for now just for today you just imagine this is a gap here and because of the it is closed normally okay it it hangs like this okay it is open then there is a pressure this blood comes into the right ventricle and as the blood keeps filling in the right ventricle what happens after a certain point of time because of the pressure itself the valve gets closed so that this will not go back into the atrium so when the ventricle contract though there is a there is a valve here because of the pressure the valve gets closed and when it squeezes when the ventricle squeezes it doesn't go back rather there is an opening that comes from the ventricle and this ventricle goes to the lung i'm sorry this blood vessel goes to the lung 
from the right ventricle so when the ventricular contraction on the right side happens the carbon dioxide rich blood from the right ventricle moves into the lungs and in the lungs it hits the lung and in the lungs what happens the lung is already ready with inhaled oxygen the oxygen that you have taken from atmosphere from nature what are all the things which are responsible for this oxygen plants are responsible plants photosynthesis is responsible and in that photosynthesis water that you pour to the plant or the nature gives in the form of rain is responsible and then for photosynthesis to occur sunlight is important you see so the entire nature right from the sun to that of rain to that of earth that of plant everything is dependent on for everything is a contributory factor for you to breathe you see so the whole of the nature including the sun okay everything is important for you to live so somewhere we should be more grateful to the nature right so here the gaseous exchange takes place what happens is this blood which goes there which was now filled with carbon dioxide suddenly this carbon dioxide which is a waste material enters into the lung and the oxygen which was there enters into this blood the same blood it releases the carbon dioxide in the lung it takes in the oxygen and the same blood through another blood vessel now reaches this left atrium now you see the interesting part is the blood until here was rich with carbon dioxide now the same blood became rich with oxygen because of the exchange and on the left atrium suddenly there is this blood but this blood is rich with oxygen the blood which is rich with oxygen we call it as oxygenated blood the blood which is rich with carbon dioxide we simply call it as deoxygenated blood right same way when this contraction happens blood from the left atrium moves through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle okay into the left ventricle in the same way as the left ventricle fills it closes this valve so that when it contracts the blood goes out through the aorta okay through the aorta it goes into upper parts of the body and lower parts of the body when it goes to the upper parts of the body it goes into so it goes into a vessel which is i mean blood vessel called as the common carotid artery the common carotid artery splits into internal carotid artery and external carotid artery external carotid artery gives to neck face and other regions the internal carotid artery goes through the skull goes through the cranium and enters into the brain and to the brain the internal carotid artery supplies blood which blood oxygen rich blood and your brain requires oxygen and glucose continuously and blood supply has to be there so this blood vessel which goes up the internal carotid artery gets bifurcated from the common carotid artery which is which is again extension of the aortic arch so there is an arch here okay there is an arch this use your imagination this is not an accurate uh, diagram it's a three dimensional thing but just imagine that there is an aortic arch from the arch it just bounces up okay in a simpler way uh, you can you can you can remember it this way that there is an aortic arch like this and one branch goes up another branch goes up so from the aortic aortic arch it goes up now you see this the interesting part here is the blood vessel which goes from the heart to the tissue or to an organ is called as artery you see this this is okay so this is your large blood vessel which is called as the aorta the aorta comes down a little bit okay aorta comes becomes a slightly thinner and you call it as artery so this is your aorta and this is your artery artery becomes even more thinner and we call it as arteriole okay renal arteriole it's a thinner blood vessel okay and then there is a cell here into which this further thins down and we call it as capillary okay we call it as capillary so capillaries rapidly give this oxygen which was required for this glycolysis it gives this oxygen and the same blood now takes up the carbon dioxide which is released from the cell and again it comes out from the cell the same capillaries comes out of the cell as venule this time see this so it is a one complete structure the one complete cycle okay i'm not able to extend this here so it, it is one complete cycle what actually happens here is this particular blood vessel which is there this arteriole it enters into the cell as capillary okay so this arteriole it's the extension of this arteriole okay the arteriole which is there it enters into the cell which we were seeing earlier okay and then it it becomes very thin and it enters as capillaries inside 
and here now what happens is capillaries release oxygen and take up carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide once again comes back to the heart see this is a cyclical process that happens since we call it as a circulatory system it is a circulatory system that is happening here and what is responsible for this circulation it is because it is the, the contraction and relaxation the pumping action the forceful contraction of the atria followed by forceful contraction of the ventricles is responsible for the movement the circular or cyclic movement of the uh, uh, of the blood okay at any given point of time the right side of the heart contains deoxygenated blood the left side of the heart contains oxygenated blood so the left side contains oxygenated blood interestingly the blood vessels which is carried from the tissue to the heart are called as veins okay and the veins generally contain deoxygenated blood similarly arteries generally contain oxygenated blood there is one exception and that is this blood vessels which are going to the lungs and coming to the heart you see this any blood vessel which goes from heart to tissue is considered to be a artery but this is the only artery called as the pulmonary artery which contains deoxygenated blood similarly any blood vessel coming from the tissue to the heart is a vein but this is the only vein which contains oxygenated blood called as pulmonary vein this is only one example one exception right because of the movement the flow of the directional flow of the blood is from the tissue to the heart this is categorized as a vein but this is the only vein that is having Uh, oxygenated blood whereas all of the other veins they have deoxygenated blood. so generally speaking veins carry deoxygenated blood this is an exception the pulmonary artery and pulmonary veins are exception so what is exactly contributing to this kind of a movement this kind of a movement is contributed by this contraction and relaxation series of contractions and relaxations of the heart is what is contributing to this and what exactly in the heart is contributing this kind of series of contraction and relaxation okay I'll, i'll i'll just get there to that point uh, you know uh, just a quick quick uh, quick understanding okay so you see this this is the heart that we saw okay uh, thought say who heart it is <laughs> i am not an expert in diagrams but just try to imagine and that too with a with a pad the diagrams are not uh, very accurate but nevertheless i hope you are able to imagine and uh, understand this now you see this what is happening here This is a very important point here, which is called as the sinoatrial node. Okay, this is the sinoatrial node, and this sinoatrial node is also called as the pacemaker. Okay, another node here, a very important node here, called as the atrioventricular node. Okay, now this pacemaker is the one which is responsible for this series of contractions and relaxations of the heart. Okay, so what happens is. this pacemaker has two important activities to it the first activity is called as automaticity that is it is automatic it is self stimulatory in nature okay the second one it has something called as dominant see each of the cell in the heart can have they have the potential ability to act as a pacemaker but sinoatrial node only is the actual pacemaker or it is controlling the entire heart hence this dominant okay and because it has the capability to excite itself automaticity or it is automatic in nature now why does this contraction happen to the atria is because the sinoatrial node contracts i mean uh, uh, sinoatrial node excites itself automatically you see what happens is this sinoatrial node it gets excited okay it automatically gets active or activated because sinoatrial node is activated the result of that is the activation of its adjacent cells because this cell is active it activates the adjacent cell because this is active it activates the adjacent cell like this what happens in the entire atria all the cells are getting activated now the question here is if you take any point of the atria at any point say this point and say why is this active the answer is because its adjacent cell got active if you say why is this active its adjacent cell got active if you ask why is this like this if you trace you ask this guy in the front saying why are you active it says because pacemaker is active and if you ask the pacemaker why are you active it will say i am automatic okay i am always active okay so the pacemaker sets the tone for the heartbeat the electric the, the signals here is actually passed in the form of electricity 
like a current it passes and it just passes in an instance that when it is active it just passes it it's not that the cell here is getting into a cardiac cycle first and this somewhere here in this extreme is going to get into cardiac cycle later that difference is not perceptible okay even though this is somewhere farther here and the signal is originated here the way in which the signal travel is so quick that there is no apparent difference that is found okay when the signals pass here what happens all the signal just passes to both the atria in one shot and both the atria immediately contract both the atria contract simultaneously when they contract simultaneously what happens the deoxygenated blood which was present on the right atrium it flows through the tricuspid valve into the respective right ventricle the oxygenated blood which was present in the left atrium through the bicuspid valve flows flows into the respective left ventricle and the signal what happens to this this signal all these things go to both the atria and they come to this one point here atrioventricular node they all go here they come to this point and from this point they spread into both the ventricles okay through the his purkins fiber system uh, the bundle of his and purkins fibers it starts spreading to both the ventricles in this manner it spreads to both the ventricles and both the ventricles contract simultaneously they contract simultaneously such that the deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle moves into the lung oxygenated blood from the left ventricle is supplied to the rest of the body slightly stronger and larger is this left ventricle compared to the right ventricle because it supplies directly to the rest of the body the oxygenated blood okay here the important point you should remember is as we saw the aorta which this is an aortic arch okay this is an aortic arch uh, this aortic arch supplies from this aortic arch the blood is supplied to various parts of the body one important artery what we saw was a common carotid artery this common common carotid artery splits one goes up and one goes to the side which goes to the face and other parts and one the internal carotid artery goes to the brain okay so there is internal uh, carotid artery that goes to the brain but from the brain what happens is let us say that i draw like this okay please bear with my diagram okay this is a person okay this is the skull and then there is a neck okay so let us say the eye is here there is this person okay the teeth is here okay now let us say i do a transverse section of the skull that is i cut the skull like this i cut the skull in order to look at this cranium So now what happens? I see the skull presented in this manner. You understand what I'm saying? I see the skull presented in this manner. Okay, because this is cut. I open it. Now when I completely cut it, what happens is I look at the skull in this. The upper part of the skull, which I have cut, is called as the roof of the skull. okay the lower part of the skull on which the brain is present okay is called as the floor of the skull okay now in this view i am looking at the floor of the skull you see the brain generally tends to float in the periceribrospinal fluid we'll get to that when we do cm but normally what happens when i look at the floor okay there is a hole here it's called as a foramen and there is a small hole here which is called as the internal jugular foramen or the jugular foramen these foramen are nothing but holes in the cranium in the skull okay they and when i look through this hole i am actually looking at the neck and spinal cord running straight down okay i am looking at an aerial view i am looking at this there is a hole here and there is a hole here what happens through this hole i am seeing that there is a blood vessel which is passing through this hole there is a blood vessel that is passing through this hole collecting all the deoxygenated blood from the brain a blood vessel is coming and it is forming from this hole and it is going down where it is going down from here it is coming down like this through that hole it is coming down this is called as the jugular foramen okay this is called as the jugular foramen foramen is a hole 
from this hole, that blood vessel starts here, okay? not inside the brain, but it starts somewhere here and it comes down like this. This jugular foramen is coming from the brain down at a stomach and it comes down and finally what happens that will actually bring the blood to this right, to this right atrium, right, the, through, the, the, through a vein which is called as internal jugular vein, okay. So internal jugular vein, it brings all that blood, it keeps coming from top and it brings that and through the superior vena cava, it gets connected to the superior vena cava and from the superior vena cava, all this blood is brought into the right atrium, okay. Why this part is important is there are, there are regions of brain which is really, really important. See, the brain, this is the cerebral cortex. Okay, so when you look at a brain like this, let us say two hemispheres, I'm looking at it like this. Okay, what happens is here, the front part of this is called as the cortex. Okay, the sides of the brain are, so this is called as the cortex. This is basically the cerebral cortex. So this is the cerebrum. Okay, let me put it in an easier way. Okay, these are the four lobes of the brain. This four lobes of the brain is generally seen in this man. Okay. Again, not 100% accurate, just for convenience, you can see bottom part. Okay. The sides of the brain and the frontal part. So this part is called as the frontal lobe. Okay. The sides are called as temporal lobe. Okay, this is also temporal. The one which is behind is called as the occipital lobe. Okay, I'm not able to write here. This is occipital lobe, and these two are called as the parietal lobe. Okay, so when you look at it from the side, what happens is if I just take one side of the brain and see, this will be my here. I'll see a part of the part of the occipital lobe. Okay, I will see part of I'll see the part of a frontal lobe. I will see the temporal lobe, I will see the parietal lobe, and I will see the occipital lobe. Okay. These are the four lobes of the brain. Okay. Now, this parietal lobe is present between the frontal lobe and occipital lobe, okay, on the upper side. Okay, on the side is the temporal. Okay, there is uh, uh, Inside this, there is this another region. We'll not we'll not get there, but generally these are the four lobes which are visible. You see, anything which is in front, like for example, there is the esophagus. In front of the esophagus is trachea. Okay. In front of the trachea is the heart. Let us say or lung. Let us say. This lung is anterior to trachea. Trachea is anterior to the esophagus. So when I'm saying something is anterior, I'm saying it is in front of. Trachea is posterior to the lung. When I say something anatomically is posterior, it is behind. Understand this? If I say something is inferior, that is beneath it. If I'm saying something is superior, it is above it. Okay. So this is the upper part, the cerebral region of the brain, inferior to the cerebral. Uh, cerebrum is your cerebellum. Okay. Inferior to the cerebrum is the cerebellum. And between cerebrum and cerebellum on the inferior region is what is called as the brain stem. Okay. The brain stem. So this brain stem is inferior to the cerebellum. We will see all these diagrams and things in detail. I am just trying to save time and quickly uh, moving on. You see, if this is the cortex, okay. Somewhere here is your cerebellum, and here starts your brain stem. Okay, so the brain stem which starts here and goes down as the spinal cord. Why? Because the lower part of the brain stem is your medulla oblongata. A little upper to that is called as pons veroli, and even above that is, is the midbrain. Okay, all the three put together is called as brain stem. So you have the brain stem with three regions, you have the cerebellum and then you have the cerebrum, okay. Now, 
what happens is there are so when you talk about central nervous system it is simply the brain plus spinal cord that's it but when you are talking about peripheral nervous system you are talking about the nerves from brain and spinal that comes out of them out of these brain and spinal cord so once they come out you are calling it as peripheral nervous system this peripheral nervous system is having nerves from two regions you have what is called as cranial nerve and you have the spinal nerve okay you have the cranial nerve and you have the spinal nerve. okay this is part of your peripheral nervous system functionally peripheral nervous system is divided into you can say two two types of function one is called as the somatic function another one you call can call it as autonomic function this autonomic function has nerves from brain and spinal cord which coordinate the automatic or autonomic function which are further segmented into two types one is called as the sympathetic i'm going fast don't worry when we look at this in detail i'll go slowly and make you understand it's just to give you a flavor this is parasympathetic okay you have two segmentation of nerves which are part of the peripheral nervous system part of the autonomic peripheral nervous system so these are automatically they are governed the origin of the sympathetic system is predominantly the spinal nerve okay the sympathetic system is called as the thoraco lumbar outflow of the nerves from the spinal cord okay the sympathetic is called as thoraco lumbar okay, thoracic region and lumbar region both are part of spinal cord thoraco lumbar this is the sympathetic outflow all the sympathetic system nerves peripheral nerves they come from thoraco lumbar region whereas the autonomic nervous system of the parasympathetic system when i talk about parasympathetic system it is called as cranio sacral outflow see this a very interesting sacrum is the sacral region is part of the spinal cord but cranium is the brain right so the cranial nerves of the peripheral nervous system they come out from the brain stem they come out from the brain stem majority of these nerves go to the face and organs of the head okay cranial nerve 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 12 all these go to the organs of the head predominantly but there is one important cranial nerve that comes out from the medulla oblongata which is called as the cranial nerve 10 okay 10 the 10th cranial nerve comes from the medulla oblongata and from the medulla oblongata it comes down okay we saw already there is this is the floor of the cranium it comes down from the medulla oblongata of the brain and it travels through this hole here and this hole is your internal jugular foramen or simply the jugular foramen okay from the jugular foramen of the floor of the cranium it starts coming down and where does it go it starts coming down comes to the neck and from the neck it goes to different branches it starts moving along the thoracic region doesn't stop there come down goes to various parts of the abdominal region okay and this is just one tenth cranial nerve and this is called as the vagus nerve and interestingly this vagus nerve it extends to either side okay from the brain till the digestive tract the connections of the vagus nerve are in this fashion there is one axon which goes out okay this axon's terminals are connected to the dendrites of another axon and this also goes out okay like this two axon connections are there in autonomic nervous system okay if the so this is called as the presynaptic so this is the synapse this is the presynaptic neuron this is the postsynaptic neuron the neurotransmitter released by the postsynaptic neuron if it is noradrenaline or adrenaline 
then you consider it to be part of the sympathetic nervous system. If the postsynaptic neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, then you consider it as part of your parasympathetic nervous system. And we will get to this in detail. The, the point that I'm trying to make is having understood the function of the heart, what you're seeing is you're seeing that the sinoatrial node governs mm, heart rate because that is the pacemaker. The sinoatrial node is innervated. That is, there is a nerve that comes from the top and it sends its branch to the sinoatrial node. And this is your vagus nerve. And vagus nerve secretes acetylcholine. So basically, the innervation that controls the sinoatrial node is your parasympathetic system. Okay, the question in GPAD 24, I don't have access to all the questions, but one question was the vagus nerve. Which nerve from the, which cranial nerve contributes to the heartbeat? Right? It's not only that. If they go to one step ahead and ask, where does this or what is the cranial nerve that contributes to heartbeat instead of vagus nerve, if they say cranial nerve number 10, you will get that answer. And today, you also know not only that it is cranial nerve number 10, that it originates in the medulla. And you also know that the medulla is part of brainstem. And that brainstem is part of three regions, midbrain, pons veroli, and medulla oblongata. And you also know that the vagus nerve travels along the same hole in the cranial floor, that it travels along the same hole where the internal jugular vein comes and brings the deoxygenated blood to the right atrium. Okay. As a consequence of this, you will start understanding what happens within the cell? I am saying that sinoatrial node is automatic. But exactly what happens, what changes in the ions happens such that the electricity is passed. What happens in each of the cells? What happens if this electricity is blocked here? Right? Then it is it leads to arrhythmia. How does arrhythmia happen? Similarly, what happens in the coronary vessel? What if there is a blockade because of blood clot or an injury? Okay, what happens in case of a myocardial infarction? What happens if the blood pumping does not take place? All the blood is here, okay? And then it is just getting congested in the heart. Leads to congestive cardiac failure or left ventricular dysfunction, okay? Or left ventricular systolic dysfunction. So what happens in that case? What are the drugs which are used? How does BP contribute to all these things? What does What are the hematonics that could be used to dissolve the clot if it is present, right? What is the brain function? Okay, what is the parasympathetic system? What is the sympathetic effect on the heart? What are the parasympathetic effects on the heart? Right? And what is what happens in case of a patient with Alzheimer's? What happens in case of a patient with Parkinson's disease? What happens in seizures? Where the where is the focus of the seizures? It is in the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, or the occipital lobe. Where is it? Depending on that, what is the manifestation? We will not go very much in deep into all these different units of anatomy, physiology, um, chemistry. I also deal with some amount of chemistry while explanations, but, and some of our faculty members also. We want to, because we are time bound, right? We have a, we have a time constraint that we can only go that much. But my whole point is we will also ensure that you understand slightly in depth and it becomes very easily comprehensible like a story. So tomorrow somebody asks you any question, you will be very clear with the entire picture in the mind that, oh, this is what is happening. So you understand the concept, you understand the physiology, you understand the anatomical regions, and then you understand the pharmacology. And thereby you understand the drugs, toxicity, some chemistry, thereby you understand especially the toxicity. And then you move forward. So this is the kind of a wholesome picture is envisioned so that by the time you finish your GPAD, you have a very strong foundation. And not only that, parallelly, what we want to do is also give you motivational sessions, we also want to make sure that we give you, uh, you know, some career guidance from industry. So all these things are there. So I would strongly urge you uh, to use this opportunity because simply we are here to bring that experience onto the table and make you good citizens. Okay, this is the this is the hope. Um, all of us have a common interest. Uh, we love the education system as such. We love teaching. We love interacting with students, younger minds. We like to be challenged, we like to be questioned. But the future of our country depends on the way you shape yourself. And this is a contribution that probably I can do.
right my best i can try to give you make myself a better person by by giving this uh, knowledge whatever i have and also learn from you mutually and i can contribute in in my personal life to the society the way i can and professionally i can contribute uh, by this by this teaching so you have a course lined up for the entire year uh, we will have uh, we will have some planned classes we will cover all the subjects uh we will also give you the importance of even subjects like jurisprudence i understand a lot of people they may not uh, study much at least that was my experience uh, many students don't give focus but and also not many questions are asked but it becomes very important for the industry to for candidates to understand jurisprudence and regulatory aspects so all these things we will touch upon that's the plan um, we are trying to give our best um, the goal is to make you get uh, excellent ranks and get admitted the, that is the immediate goal the larger goal is to ensure that you do wonders in the pharma community and uh, make uh, make yourself as a very contributing factor for the country and yourself and your families and this is what we we also want to do through this through this opportunity that we have i think with that note i'll just take a break because if you have to continue a topic it will take hours together yeah, my and most of our faculty members lectures will be long it will be part 1 part 2 part 3 like that it keeps going on uh, and the story keeps connecting one with the other so you better join early and be part of the classes and also we have uh, uh we have uh, we have some recordings done uh, so i think you may also have recordings that jyoti ma'am will be able to guide you um yeah so for for stipend i think you'll have to contact arthi your university wherever you contact your m farm uh, wherever you get into m farm they are the ones who can get in touch with uh, whatever is the committee a uh, beat aicte or mhra i don't think now it is mhra but during our time it was mhra it is always through the university so you will have to ask your university people concerned persons to get in touch with the central uh, central government and uh, and uh, the authorities in order to get your fellowship arte uh, this is this is not even uh, in students you may you may you may write a mail you may contact them but formally it's your college where you take admission in m farm it is they who have to um contact the uh, central government officers to get the fellowship right it's not given to your account it's it i mean it's given to your account through through your college okay and once you take admission in m farm you will get uh, you will get that. okay um so yeah having said this i think i wish you all the best um uh, uh, do join uh, i mean do train yourself um, i would i would still say that you know you may you may uh, you may think but uh, taking responsibility of your future is very important so i think it will be interesting um, you will learn a lot of things um, and uh, yeah i think we look forward to your success